Thomas Tom Island has worked hard to achieve his goals, learning to drive, living on his own, graduating from college, obtaining full-time employment, running two marathons, well, and having a girlfriend. Tom recently left his career as a certified public accountant to educate, inspire, and motivate the local affected by autism and other learning differences. One of only 4,000 distinguished Toastmasters in the world and a member of the National Speakers Association, his mantra, Know Yourself, Love Yourself, Be Yourself, has been featured in keynote speeches at autism conferences around the country. It is among the topics in his award-winning, best-selling book, Come to Life, Your Guide to Self-Discovery, and has been featured in a TEDx talk. Tom recently had the honor of speaking at the United Nations as an emerging leader in the autism community that helps people become their best selves through coaching and consulting. He plans to become the first ever Toastmasters accredited speaker with autism and a certified human potential coach in 2019. Sure. Tom currently lives in Santa Clarita, California with his dog, Bridget. Aww. What kind of dog? A wiener dog. A wiener Aww. dog. A wiener dog. A dog. Okay, that's very important. <laughs> The title of the speech tonight, Come to Life. Please welcome Tom Island. I'll deliver from right here so I'm to turn yourself around. I love the diversity and the uh, types of generations that are in this room tonight. I'm actually a part of what's called the Zennial generation. If you've ever heard of this, X-E-N-N-I-A-L. I see we have a fellow Zennial fan here too. For those of you that aren't familiar with that term, it's someone who was born between the years 1977 and 1983, or the Star Wars years, as I call them. <laughs> and so that means I have Generation X's work ethic and Millennials, you only live once, attitude. <laughs> and both qualities have served me really well over the years and helped me succeed, but not without the struggle. So you heard in my introduction that I have autism. I'll tell you a little bit about what that means. And how that brought me to where I am today. So autism is considered a social communication disorder. It affects about 1 in 59 children today. And in a nutshell for me, it meant I was really good with book smarts, but I wasn't really good with street smarts. So talking to my peers, telling a girl I liked her, stating what I wanted, relating to people, that was a struggle for me from the time I was a young. And I'll tell you about how, when I first got diagnosed, back in 1987 when I was living in uh, Illinois, my aunt, that's my mother's sister, was the autism specialist for the state of Illinois. And she suspected that I might be on the autism spectrum. So she told my mother that I might be on the spectrum, but my mother wouldn't have any part of it. No, no, all young boys, all geniuses like to line up their cars in the front row. So what if he's sitting in the corner playing by himself? He doesn't have time for their silly games. So my mother had denial, but my aunt had other ideas. She took me, my aunt, for an informal <laughs> screening without my mother's knowledge. And I got screened, and I'm thinking it's a play date. Okay, I'm having some fun with my aunt, doing some board games, a couple of puzzles. This is fun. Little did I know that I was being screened for autism. And back in the 80s, the diagnostic criteria read that you have to have an intellectual disability, which is the more politically correct term for mental retardation in order to have autism. I did not have an intellectual disability, therefore, I was not diagnosed with autism. But fast forward to 1996, when I was diagnosed. The criteria from the manuals had, the diagnosis criteria had changed. You don't have to have an intellectual disability to have autism. And that's when I got officially diagnosed. Now, from a young age, I knew I was meant to do something extraordinary with my life. I was meant for something great. But before I could live my best life, first, I had to come to life. And as I found out more and more about myself, including my diagnosis, I discovered that there was a very challenging road ahead, but I had people in my life that would help me get through it. I'll give you the example of when my parents first sat me down to tell me about my diagnosis. Now, I live by a mantra. My secrets to success that I created to this day the secrets that I give you tonight are know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. I repeat that. Know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. 
So understanding your diagnosis and first knowing that you have one are the key components. So let me tell you about what prompted my parents to tell me about my diagnosis. Well, I have a younger sister and a younger brother. They're both getting calls from friends looking to hang out on the weekends or after school, have sleepovers, have fun with other people. One day I asked my mother, Mom, why doesn't the phone ever ring for me? And my mother had to think fast on her toes because she could have said, oh, you don't have any friends or you don't know how to make friends. She assured me that you and Tom are still learning how to make friends. And that gave me a little bit of hope. Okay, so we're still learning how to make friends. That set up a bigger discussion that would change my life forever. So my parents sat me down at the kitchen table and proceeded to tell me that I have what's called a pattern of differences. You know how you rewind your favorite scenes on Sesame Street over and over again? You know how you can rearrange and magnetize letters on the refrigerator into words? You know how you say lines from movies or TV even if they don't really apply to the conversation? These differences have a pattern. Do you want to know what that pattern is called? I said, no, no I don't. And I retreated to my bedroom. I thought my life as I knew it was over. My brain was broken. I didn't want to be different. So I must have cried in there for a good hour. But one of my special interests at the time, in a way it still is, raise your hand if you're a fan of Batman. <laughs> or other Got a few Batman fans here. I thought about what would Batman do in this situation? If he were faced with some challenge, some difficulty, he would always find a way. He would be one step ahead of his enemies. He would face his fears. It was time for me to be the hero in my life. So I emerged from my room, went to my parents and said, okay, mom, what's the pattern called? And she explained to me that autism well, a pattern of developmental differences does not mean I'm any different or that they were not going to love me no matter what, or that they would love me no matter what. They proceeded to tell me about the people with autism that were successful in the world. Thomas Jefferson, Steven Spielberg, Albert Einstein, maybe even Bill Gates. So I said, okay, if I'm going to have autism, I'm going to have it like Bill Gates has. <laughs> Still working on the billions of dollars. But I had some answers because too many people with autism grow up their whole lives without a diagnosis or their parents know about the diagnosis but don't tell their children about it and then the children don't understand themselves and grow up thinking something's wrong with them or they're different or that their parents are ashamed of them because they won't tell them. So for my parents to share with me what my diagnosis was and what it meant to them, that's the tone for the rest of my life. Knowing yourself including your diagnosis and how it affects you, not just positively, what you're good at, but also what you can improve upon. That's what we work on here in Toastmasters. Your speeches are great in this regard. For the future, consider working on X, Y, and Z. The same is true with an autism diagnosis. My parents assured me from the get-go that they would love me no matter what, but my parents' love would not matter at all unless I loved myself. This brings us to the second part of the mantra, know yourself, now we're at love yourself. Because RuPaul has said, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love someone else? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. <laughs> Basically, I really, really wanted a girlfriend from a young age. So when I liked a girl, I would let her know. So I would give her a call, left a voicemail saying I'd like to go out with her, hang out, and wait for her to answer me back. If she didn't answer me back, I could call her again. Maybe she didn't get the message. <laughs> Left another voicemail, waited for her answer. I still didn't hear anything from her, so I called her again. Left another voicemail, still nothing. Gave her another call, and by now she was starting to get a little scared. I, but I thought that Batman determination, and the persistence, it might eventually pay off. Well, it didn't in that instance, because she told my sister, this girl, if your brother doesn't stop calling me, I'm going to the police. <laughs> Thank goodness she didn't go to the police, otherwise I could be serving time right now. <laughs> but my sister told my mother what had happened, and my mother had to set the record straight with me and say that a relationship, a friendship, is like a tennis game. I serve you the ball, and you have to serve it back. Because I was serving, and serving, and serving, and serving, without getting any serves back. So the rule is that I get two serves, two calls, 
and there's no bounce back high time with Elder Girl to play with. And that is a rule I live by to this day. But too many people with autism are saying and doing all the wrong things. And our young people in this day and age aren't that explicit or direct. You'll hear a girl say, call me twice, and if I don't answer you back, go away. Instead, we live in a see something, say something society. We involve the police and let them handle the kid who doesn't get it. Or we abandon those who don't pick up on our social cues or those underlying rules that you pick up when you have interactions with people. People with autism do not pick up on those rules. They don't get the hint. So for me, I was directly and explicitly told what to do and how to behave. And my sister was a huge source of help for me because she does know what women want. So she told me, Tom, girls like a guy who keeps himself clean. Girls like a guy who knows how to dance. Girls like a guy who knows how to cook. So I cleaned myself up, learned how to dance, learned how to cook, and I got dates. <laughs> Bottom line is, I knew I was worth it, and I was worthy and capable of love, and I now do have a girlfriend, but it wouldn't matter at all if I didn't love myself first. And more importantly, accepting my diagnosis, because too many people live in denial. I don't have autism, but the parents don't accept it themselves. They don't think the kid will understand. So by accepting yourself, that's what it takes to truly love yourself. And now we get to the third and final part of the mantra, which has to do with being yourself. Because we have a lot of suggestions, a lot of opinions, considerations out there. You think you might need a quorum of people to help you live your life? And what it boils down to is what you want for yourself. And this is another big aspect of the autism community today, because when they do something wrong or they're inappropriately behaving, we're quick to tell them what to do instead. But then they start to think, well, there's something wrong with me, or I'm not good enough the way I am. I actually did have a relationship, and I told you I have a girlfriend. I had another girlfriend who was on the autism spectrum. She lived in Illinois, where I was born, and the same aunt who was the autism specialist introduced us. We both loved Star Wars and movies, so we used that as a foundation for our friendship. We were pen pals for about 10 years, became a couple, and she moved out here to Los Angeles to be with me. Now, she had never received help or services her entire childhood. So my mother and I are getting her assistance, like a job coach, an independent living specialist, people that would help her get to where she wanted to be. So she called her mother back in Illinois, and her mother is also on the autism spectrum. So my now ex-girlfriend explained all the help she was getting. The mother responded, they're looking to change you. Don't let them. So my ex-girlfriend resisted all the help she was getting, didn't understand that it was to help her live her best life. And I gave her four years before I realized I'm not loving myself, I'm not being myself, and I'm certainly not being my best self. And I ended the relationship. And as she's getting ready to move back to Illinois, living with her parents again, she said to me, or my mother, it's a shame you guys wanted to change me this whole time. I like myself the way I am. And I think that's where there's a big disconnect in today's society. We think our, our young people, our children, or our children's children think that we're looking to change them. They're going to put up their guard or think, F you, I'm going to find the way I am. Whereas if you can say what you're doing or suggesting will help them live the life they want, accomplish the goals that they have set for themselves, you're going to have a better chance of success. And as I mentioned in my TED talk, I'll bring this up to you now. Today's educational system, when you think about it, focuses too much on academics. What I would like to see is today's educational system focus on actualization. How many of you are familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah, quite a few of you. So on the bottom, you've got the physiological needs, and then you move up to safety, you move up to social, and esteem. at the very top of that pyramid, the ultimate goal in life is self-actualization or the desire to become your best self. So each of our young people can see they have the potential, they can realize it, and they want it for themselves, by themselves. That's what's going to make the world a better place. So as I begin to close here, and I'll take some time for questions too, I want to remind you that you cannot sit back and wait for life to come to you. It's up to you to come to life. Find your voice and use it. Solidify your message to the world and own it. And tell your story.
story and live it. Because we all have to go out there and find out what we want to do with ourselves. We have to bounce back from failures like Batman did, and keep moving forward. And each and every one of us, emotionally, is responsible for our own happiness. So you, I leave it to you to discover or rediscover what makes you happy. Because it's not going to come to you. You must come to life. Does anybody have any questions? Or I have a autism spectrum, what was it like for you uh, attending college and also in the workplace with people? Okay, so I'll start with college. Basically, from the time I was a senior in high school, I knew I liked Star Wars and I was good with numbers, and I put my goal in life to be George Lucas' accountant. And I mapped out the classes I had to take to make that happen. And I went from a high school to a community college and then to a four-year university, Cal State Northridge. So that transition, or rather going from a little high school to a big college, that helped me ease the, the transition pains, if you will, helped me realize my goal. With respect to employment, I was fortunate enough through the power of networking to find someone who worked for Disney. So straight out of college, I did an internship in the property tax department at the Walt Disney Company. I was there for three tax seasons, and after I left the company, Disney acquired Lucasfilm. So when you think about it, uh, retroactively and uh, indirectly, I was George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> and I had several, uh, in, I had an internship with the big four accounting from Deloitte. I had several temp jobs. I had finally got permanent work with benefits. But there was a manager in my first job where I had gainful employment for the first time. He was not accepting of my diagnosis. Because I didn't disclose in an interview, I waited until after I got the job. But he thought I lied to him in the interview and didn't want to help me, which was illegal. And I think that was the beginning of the end of my accounting career. I have a CPA, still licensed, but three and a half years ago, I left that line of work behind because I belong here, telling my story, sharing my wisdom, and helping people on a personal level to become their best selves. So I've been very fortunate to have these opportunities and these experiences that a lot of people with autism don't get their lives. That, you know, having that Batman mentality has definitely been a huge help. you wrote the Batman? Yeah, I recently did. I was, in a, I was in San Diego last week being master of ceremonies for an event and found a gentleman in Escondido who has a, an authentic Batmobile and he gave me a ride in his <laughs> Batmobile. Yeah, I'll tell you about my bucket list a little bit here. Do you have a question? How would you describe your level of comfort now in social situations? Uh, much higher than it was when I was a, a kid. Uh, I found that uh, Jack Canfield, he wrote the Chicken Soup for the Soul books and the Success Principles. He's the person that I think really opened up my mind and my heart to a lot of new experiences. And even watching some reality TV shows, like I mentioned, what my sister told me about relationships. Who here has ever seen or heard of Beauty and the Geek? It's a social experiment where eight beautiful women who got by on their looks most of their lives were paired up with eight geeky guys who couldn't speak to women to save their lives. They get paired up to see what they can learn from one another, and it was in this show that I see what women want, or the kind of clothes that men should be wearing, what are the topics that women like to talk about. Halfway through each season, the geeks would get makeovers, new clothes, new hairstyles, so because of that show, I get my eyebrows waxed every six weeks <laughs> this day. And now I'm more comfortable and confident in those social situations. But it really took a lot of practice. I have had many failed relationships. Things didn't always go the way I wanted them to. But like that, I just kept picking myself up and moving forward. And Jack Canfield was the one who encouraged me to construct a bucket list. 101 things I want to do before I die. And I started about three years ago, 101 items, and I've already accomplished 20 of them. One of them was right in the Batmobile. <laughs> Anyone else have questions? Well, thank you all very much.